How are you doing this morning? Good. It was intended to be a rhetorical question. (laughs) How are you doing spiritually? This morning, we're going to take a little time to do some personal inventory. For seven Sundays, we have looked at Jesus' letters to churches, churches that existed 2,000 years ago, churches that populated a Roman province of Asia Minor, modern-day Turkey, places we have not been, the people we have not met, churches that are far removed, far distant from us in experience, culture, language. And yet I hope that you found that the letters to these churches had some impact on your own heart and your own life. These letters are designed in our Bibles to be read by individuals. And while those first century churches would have had ample warrant to directly apply the words of Jesus... And subsequent eras of church history have likewise been able to look at their churches through the lens of these letters and analyze, how are we doing as a church? I think we also have biblical warrant to look at these letters from an individual level. I want you to look, for instance, at the letter to the church at Ephesus in chapter 2. In verse 7, we have this refrain, this invitation And it says, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And just a couple grammatical details here. He, him, are singular. If you have ears to hear, you singular, listen to what Jesus says to the churches, plural. Here we have biblical warrant for immediate application of everything we've heard in these letters to the seven churches to the individual Christian life. And I hope you've had ears to hear already to this point. But what we're going to do this morning is more narrowly focus on our own individual spiritual conditions. I want to invite you with me into some introspection through the lens of these letters to ask yourself, how am I doing? How am I doing spiritually? And to allow Jesus himself to bring the analytics. Some of the questions you should be asking about yourself. Some of the things you should be investigating. And we will compile these seven letters in in sort of a self-examination. Put your own heart in the Petri dish, get out the microscope, And let me just encourage us, don't shy away from such things. There could be nothing more dangerous to your spiritual condition than to assume everything's hunky-dory and to go about your business when things aren't what they should be. Let's invite the Lord to help us in this this morning. Pray with me. Oh God, we come before your word. Lord Jesus, we come before these, your personal letters to seven churches, ancient churches. And we seek by these letters to have immediate import, application to our own hearts, to our own lives. Would you use the next moments in these letters to root out unbelief, to root out idolatries, misplaced affections, stumbling blocks, compromises. Lord, would you use your word to penetrate deeply, help us to see rightly the way you would see our own lives. We want this examination. We want the encouragement that comes. We want the life that results. We want the fruitfulness. So we ask for your help by your Holy Spirit that we might have ears to hear what you have said to the churches. It's in your name we pray it. Amen. We'll use the same outline we have used for the letters themselves to the churches, six elements of Jesus' evaluation of your life. I didn't include a map this week because you know where you live and Jesus knows where you live. 
Jesus knows right where you are. So the first element of this is the salutation. Each of the letters has a greeting, most of which was brought over from the vision of Christ in chapter 1 that John saw. And if we put them together, we get to have a rounded out picture of the Lord Jesus Christ, the one who addresses our hearts. We find out in chapter 2, verse 1, in the letter to Ephesus, that Jesus is the one who holds the seven stars, those angels in his right hand, and he is the one who walks among the seven golden lampstands, those are the churches. That is a depiction of Christ's possession of the churches, his presence amidst his people. He is sovereign and he is concerned for the health and the spiritual state of his people. Jesus is indeed the light which the lampstands are supposed to display. We learned in the letter in Smyrna in chapter 2, verse 8, that he is the first and the last. These are titles of deity, references to descriptions of God in the book of Isaiah. He is also the one who became dead and then came to life, a reminder of Jesus' substitutionary death in the place of sinners. And then the acceptance of payment by God the Father. Jesus rose from the dead to demonstrate that his payment for our sins actually was acceptable, sufficient to pay God's infinite justice. With this comes a guarantee of power over death. The one who knows us and is in our midst is the one who suffered death himself. He experienced it and he conquered it and he promises victory over death for all those who are loyal to him. In chapter 2, verse 12, in the letter to Pergamum, we find Jesus is the one who has the sharp two-edged sword. That is, he is the warrior king who in blazing glory will destroy his enemies and he has some sharp things to say to his churches as well. In chapter 2, verse 18, in the letter to Thyatira, we discover Jesus is the Son of God, a, a title of deity, who has eyes like a flame of fire. That is a picture of his scrutiny, his omniscience. Nothing escapes his gaze, and he has feet like burnished bronze. He is brilliant in hot purity. In chapter 3, verse 1, in the letter to Sardis, we discover that Jesus is the one who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. This depicts the omniscient, omnipresent, multifaceted activity of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit of God at work in the world and in his people. And it's a reminder that there can be no spiritual life apart from the Holy Spirit. There is no new birth or regeneration. There is no sanctification apart from the work of the Spirit. In fact, those who are dead in transgressions and sins cannot apprehend spiritual things unless the Holy Spirit of God makes one alive and gives one ears to hear. And Jesus, the one who possesses the sevenfold Spirit of God, is the one who dispenses spiritual life through the Holy Spirit. We discover in the letter to Philadelphia in chapter 3, verse 7, that Jesus is holy And this idea of the Holy One, a title for God and a title for Messiah, both in the Old Testament and the New Testament. That he is also the true one, that is genuine and faithful. He will not go back on his word. He is trustworthy and reliable. And he has the key of David. Shorthand for Jesus is the only one to give access to the kingdom. The millennial reign of Messiah on the earth extending into the eternal state. He opens and no one shuts and he shuts and no no one opens. Jesus alone has keys to life and salvation and eternity. In Revelation 3.14 in the letter to Laodicea, we discover that Jesus is the Amen. The so be it, the truth. Jesus Christ is the embodiment of truth. He is also called the faithful and true witness. That is... His assessment of your life is an accurate assessment. His opinion of your life is what counts. And then he also describes himself to that church at Laodicea as the beginning of the creation of God. That is the origin of everything, the source of every created thing. There's nowhere else you could look. You you can't get around Jesus. You can't eke out of physical life or material life some sort of ultimate thing, satisfaction, meaning, or purpose if you neglect Christ. He is the origin and source of all things. In summary, Jesus Christ has you in his hands. 
He is the omnipresent, sovereign Lord of the churches, the first and the last, who paid for sin and conquered death, the warrior judge with the two-edged sword, the Son of God, brilliant, pure, holy, scrutinizing, who provides spiritual life through his spirit, the one true God and only Messiah who holds the keys to eternity. He is the embodiment of truth and the source of all things. This is the one who addresses you even now in his word. We move to the commendations. What is commendable in your life? If Jesus were to presently, personally audit your spiritual condition, What would he give a thumbs up to? What would he encourage? What would he commend? Maybe some of these commendations are true of your own life. It's comforting when Jesus says, I know. It's also convicting. As we walk through these commendations, I want you to be encouraged to the degree that these things are true in your life and excel still more. The flip side of these commendations, knowing that these are the things Jesus praises in the life of a believer, is if these are missing, take some time to examine yourself. And you can see there are areas to grow, places to shore up. Jesus says to the church at Ephesus in chapter 2, verses 2 and 3, I know your deeds, your toil, your perseverance. You cannot tolerate evil men. You put to the test those who call themselves apostles and they are not. You found them to be false. You have perseverance. You have endured for my namesake. You have not grown weary. And in verse 6, you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Jesus commends believers here for their deeds, that is their Christ-like conduct, for their toil, their all-out effort to the point of exhaustion for Christ. Their perseverance, that is, courageous acceptance of hardship, suffering, and loss. They bore up under difficulty. He praised them for their intolerance. They they did not tolerate evil men, imposters, false teachers, false apostles. He praised their endurance. They had toiled to the point of weariness, and yet they were not weary of toil for Christ. And he praised them for their hatred of the deeds of the Nicolaitans. Those were the Christians who endorsed, hey, have a little Jesus in your life and some immorality too. They can go together, it's okay. Jesus hated that doctrine, hated its effects in his people. And Jesus would commend believers for hating it likewise. Jesus commends in summary this church, these individual Christians in the church for practical holiness and theological discernment, that they were uncomfortable with compromise, that they suffered for the name of Jesus, that they labored for him, even being exhausted in their loyalty to Christ, though not exhausted of it. They were mature, established, tested, and seasoned. All of that is commendable. At Smyrna, Jesus commended affliction, poverty, and enemies. Jesus knew, he said to believers, their affliction, that pressure, that that restricting pressure that burdens the spirit, the the metaphor used as a weight of a, a large weight on top of something. He said, I know your poverty, destitution, they had nothing at all. And yet he said to them, you are wealthy. Listen, Christian, if If you have nothing, if you are barely scraping by, or worse, and you have Christ, you are wealthy beyond the world's wildest imaginations. And Jesus said, I know your enemies. He called it the blasphemy of those calling themselves Jews, and they're not. They're actually a synagogue of Satan. There was there the large Jewish population, an active religious scene, and an emperor cult, and the hostile community was ready to turn in the Christians to the authorities. They were slandered six ways from Sunday. They were called atheists, unpatriotic, home wreckers, incendiary, immoral, and cannibals. All of these were baseless accusations. Do you know what it means, Christian? Because of Christ, to face these things. To be impoverished, to feel pressure, and to be charged baselessly with things you have not done. Jesus knows, 
Jesus commends. At Pergamum in chapter 2, verse 13, Jesus says, I know where you dwell, where Satan's throne is. You hold fast my name. You did not deny my faith in the days of Antipas, my witness, my faithful one who was killed among you. Jesus commends believers there, and he would commend you, Christian, for having a tight grip on Christ when there is incentive to do otherwise. When your lives are at stake, they were in the heart of the evil empire. Where had the gospel planted itself? In the command center of of Satan, the god of this world. And the believers there said, I don't care if it costs me my life, I just want Jesus. That's commendable. At Thyatira, Jesus said, I know your deeds, chapter 2, verse 19, your love, your faith, your servants, your perseverance, and that your deeds of later greater than at first. They were growing. There was marked growth in the church, upward movement in their following of Christ. There was no commendation at Sardis, the dead church. Although Jesus said there were some who are still alive, in their midst, and so maybe an offhanded commendation if, if you find yourself in a so-called Christian community with no spiritual life and you are clinging by the fingernails to faith, that's commendable. At Philadelphia, Jesus commended this little church with power. Look at chapter three, verse eight. I know your deeds. I have put before you an open door. He says, you are little. In the English it says you have little power. That is not a mark of their weakness. He just means you're small in comparison to the great hostile environment around you. But you have power. Philadelphia was a small church in a hostile environment. They probably felt their littleness, and Jesus assures them of real spiritual power. He says, you have kept my word, you've not denied my name, you've kept the word of my perseverance. Christian, you may be insignificant in the eyes of the world, and yet experience God's power. When presented with opportunities to compromise, you keep God's word. When pressured to alter your message to accommodate the hostile world around you, you don't conform. Jesus would commend all of that. And of course, at Laodicea, there was no commendation. We summarize these commendations. We find that Jesus praises in the churches amongst Christians good deeds, labor for Christ, endurance under difficulty, discernment of false false teaching, hatred of wickedness, personal holiness, faithfulness, faithfulness in poverty and affliction, even under slander, courage under persecution, love, faith, service, and growth, and spiritual strength in a hostile culture. Jesus praises all of these things. If these kinds of things do not characterize your Christian life, then these commendations provide a window into areas to grow in. But listen, Christian, Jesus knows right where you are. He knows what you face. Every individual is in a different circumstance from every other individual. Even as churches are different from other churches in their situations and pressures. Jesus knows you. And he knows where you are. And he can commend that which is praiseworthy, that which he produces by his spirit in you and would encourage to excel still more. That leads us thirdly to confrontations. And if Jesus were conducting a personal audit, an evaluation of your own spiritual life, what would he confront? What needs to be shored up? Some of these letters have this daunting sentence, but I have this against you. At Ephesus, we find that the church had abandoned its first love, Revelation 2.4. A definite and sad departure from the love they had had at the first, a love for God that overflowed from gratitude in the gospel, 
It manifested itself in a radical alteration of lifestyle. You remember the the Ephesian believers burning 50,000 days wages worth of magic books from their old life in the center of town. They lived in a hostile environment that then persecuted them. You remember the commendations. They, they had theological discernment. They were a mature, seasoned body of believers. They had a remarkable pedigree of, of leadership in their church. And yet, this church had left its first love. The machinery of the church still pounded on. It would be like draining the oil out of an internal combustion engine and then driving for a while. You could step on the gas and it would go, but eventually would come to a grinding halt, a seized up engine and a worthless vehicle. Jesus said, if you don't fix this, I will remove the lampstand out of its place. The church at Ephesus didn't get to be a church anymore if it did not regather its first love. Go back to the love you had at the first. And I said this when we studied the letter to the church at Ephesus, this is probably the one most pointed at a Bible church that loves discernment, loves truth, is growing in maturity and lots of facets, but may be susceptible to losing its first love. This is a serious indictment of a church. It's a serious indictment of an individual Christian to have practical holiness, theological discernment, intolerance for compromise, hunting out heresy, all of those things might be in place, but the fuel of the church, fervent personal love for God through Jesus Christ is gone. The fuel of the Christian life has been drained. The church at Smyrna received no confrontation from Jesus. They, they suffered and Jesus gave them courage. Church at Pergamum received some indictments. Jesus said in verse 14 and 15, I have a few things against you. The bottom line is the church had become comfortable with compromise. Christian, are there areas in your life where you have grown comfortable with that which would destroy you? With that which trips up your Christian life? Are you placing stumbling blocks in your own path? landmines in your road. Jesus said to that church, you have some there who hold the teaching of Balaam. And you remember the story. The people of Israel, following Yahweh through the wilderness, couldn't be cursed by the false prophet Balaam at the behest of King Balak. But they did get tripped up through sexual immorality. And Jesus said in the church, you have some that follow the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Jesus said to the church at Ephesus, I hate that teaching. And here, Christians, professing Christians, had bought into the idea that you could mix a little Jesus with a worldly immorality and everything will be okay. This is a serious danger. They were dancing with those destined for destruction. They were seduced by the sin for which their enemies would be destroyed. Of course, sin is illogical and evil and deceptive. This was a a theology of antinomian license. And the problem with the church at Pergamum is they did not consider Nicolaitan teaching to be a threat to the church. Jesus knew it was. Christian, you may be here this morning and think that a little compromise, a little toying with immorality is not a threat to your life, is not a threat to your eternity, is not a threat to your soul. And Jesus knows that it is. Don't get comfortable with compromise. You need to stay on short accounts with sin. Turn away from immorality. Ask yourself this morning, what stumbling blocks am I allowing into my own life? I might be clinging to sound doctrine, but putting landmines in my path. What compromises in your life will set you up for spiritual failure? At Thyatira, Jesus addressed syncretism and pragmatism. That is, in a church that didn't face outward persecution, had a relatively comfortable existence, 
They had sort of blended into the culture around them. Notice what Jesus says in verse 20 of chapter 2. I have this against you. You tolerate the woman Jezebel, a prominent woman in the church who made herself a teacher. Her activities were calling herself a prophetess, claim of direct revelation was a false claim. She was teaching, that alone was disobedient. She led Jesus' slaves astray. She subverted the lordship of Christ. She tells Christ's slaves what to do, and what she told them to do was to stray away from Christ. She encouraged idolatry, leads them there. She enticed them to immorality by example and by her teaching. And Jesus said he would make an example of her and of all of her progeny, all of those who had followed her teaching. And the problem with the church at Thyatira was that they tolerated false teaching and a false teacher. This was a place they were to be intolerant. And false teachers only get a following when the flesh allows a foothold. It's a cheap trick. Anybody could do this. It's a salesman's gimmick. Tell Christians, you can indulge your flesh. Just follow what I'm saying. And what does the flesh want to do? Yeah, that sounds like good teaching. It's a cheap trick. Don't fall for it. The church at Thyatira had fallen for it. A false teacher like this says, we're under grace. God wants you to be happy. If the system around you compels you to compromise a little, God understands we're all broken around here. Besides, if you're making it financially, God must be happy with you. Temporal blessings are a sign that that God's not upset with you. And Jesus says, look what you've tolerated in your midst. And he threatens a severe discipline for that false teacher and her followers. Listen, there are danger signs for bad teaching. The kind of teaching that says God wants you to be happy rather than God wants you to be holy. Not not sending the message that holiness will produce true happiness. Or maybe that following Jesus is going to make your idolatrous life a little bit better. Jesus intends intends to give you the best the world has to offer. Christian, are you in the habit of assembling for yourself teachers who will tell you what you want to hear? Do you gather around your itching ears those who would tickle? Let your flesh indulge a little. A teaching that brings no conviction. A teaching that leaves you comfortable. Nothing to disrupt your sense of well-being. Teachers that will not teach the whole counsel of God's word teaching that leaves you unaccountable to one another, a teaching that emphasizes the, the blessings of following Jesus and doesn't address the hardships of holiness or the realities of suffering, doctrine that doesn't interfere with your own heart's idols or doesn't expose areas of unbelief. At Sardis in chapter 3, verse 1, Jesus indicted the church there with this very sobering statement. You have a name that you are alive, but you are dead. It was a church in name only. And you might be here this morning as a Christian in name only. Yeah, I'm a Christian, you might tell others. Without any spiritual life at all, a a nominal Christian, you you could be religious and respectable, you could have procedures and traditions and the outward garb of religion, even pretentious prayers and ceremonies and rituals, but dead. People wear crosses, express God talk and thoughts and prayers and spirituality, they even show up dutifully at buildings with the word church on a sign, but they bear no marks of spiritual life. It's possible to be at a good church, full of life, and be dead personally. Jesus gave no confrontation to the church at Philadelphia. Like Smyrna, they were a suffering church and received from their Savior only encouragements. They weren't sinless. 
But Jesus knew they needed encouragement. And to the church at Laodicea, chapter 3, beginning in verse 15, we have Jesus' description of a church that nauseated him. They were spiritually tepid, lukewarm, disease-ridden because they were self-satisfied, self-sufficient. They were indifferent to their own spiritual state. They didn't care. They didn't care how they were on the inside. They didn't care about Christ. And they said things like this, I'm rich. I've become wealthy. I have need of nothing. And Jesus' assessment is that they were wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. Again, Jesus, the reliable one, the trustworthy one, the one whose metrics and assessments are accurate, the amen, knew their true condition. And that church had two problems. Their first problem was their independent, self-satisfied, I have everything that I need, I don't need to really be thinking about my spiritual condition. Their second problem was their conformity to the culture around them. You see, the the city in which they lived was exactly as Jesus characterized the church. Wealthy, independent, self-sufficient, pulled themselves up by their own bootstraps, didn't need any help from the Roman Empire after a severe earthquake, built monuments to themselves. We built this. And so the church and the culture were indistinguishable. And at some point, like the proverbial frog in the kettle of boiling water, the church at Laodicea had become like the culture around it, independent, self-satisfied. Where they thought they were wealthy, Jesus says, you have nothing. Where they thought they could see and they could help others see, Jesus said, you are blind. Where they were self-satisfied, Jesus said, you are wretched. Where they thought themselves the hub of the fashion industry and the clothier of the world, Jesus said, you are naked. They loved their standard of living, luxurious clothing, thriving business, no persecution, monuments to their achievements. They threw in a little church going, add a little bit of Jesus to their otherwise self-satisfied life. It's probably no worse situation for a soul than to have everything you think you want in this world and to be miserable spiritually. If that's you here this morning, if if things are going your way in the world, watch out. Very dangerous place. To have all your earthly needs and desires met, to be satisfied in life without being satisfied in Christ is a very precarious situation. It makes you apathetic about spiritual life, careless about your relationship to God. And Jesus said, I will vomit such ones out of my mouth. How are you doing this morning, spiritually? Have you left your first love? Have you gotten comfortable with compromise? Are you tolerating bad teaching? Are you checking your influences? Do you have ear-tickling inputs? Are you spiritually dead? Have you succumbed totally to the world around you, indistinguishable from the culture? Are you self-satisfied, independent, indifferent to God? What do you do? This leads to the commands. Let's put these together. What would Jesus command our lives this morning? Back in chapter 2 to Ephesus, If you find that your first love has waned, if you have departed that honeymoon period of your Christian life, what do you do? Jesus says in verse 5, remember, repent, and return. Remember from where you've fallen. 180 degree turn, go back to your first love. How do you do that? It's the basics of walking with Christ. Get up in the morning and read your Bible. From the heart, with a heart that desires to meet with God, Pray, talk to him, pour out your heart to him, not in ritual monotony, not in repetition, but speaking to your heavenly father. Learn to pray again. Be on short accounts with sin, recognize it, confess it, repent, put off sin, put on righteousness in its place. 
Cultivate relationships with believers so that that love you have for God, which comes from God's love for you, flows out into your love for others, love for fellow believers, and love for the lost. Bring Christ into every relationship. Seek out the kind of brothers and sisters who will help you love Christ more and be the kind of brother and sister who will help others love Christ more. Make love of Christ the center of your life all over again. Do you remember when it was? To Smyrna. Jesus said to that church that was faithful under fire, don't be afraid. Your life's about to get worse. The trials you're under now will get more severe. There will be a specific period of testing for that church at Smyrna. You may be imprisoned or worse. I don't know what's in store for you, Christian. The New Testament over and over again says that we do not rise above our master. If he suffered, we'll suffer. All who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus shall face persecution. We've been sheltered in many ways in this country, in this era. Things change. What will it be like for us a decade from now, two decades from now, if the Lord tarries? I don't know. There could be testing for us, like at Smyrna. There could be imprisonments. What are Jesus' words? To such. Don't fear, it's about to get worse. <laughs> Satan has reasons for the godly to suffer, bad reasons, sheer malevolence, hatred. He wants to discredit God's work. Look, if he takes away your Maserati and you abandon faith, Satan wins. But God has reasons for the godly to suffer. They're different than Satan's. You may experience a circumstance where Satan intends malevolence. God intends good. Discipline, Hebrews 12. Humility, 2 Corinthians 11. Growth, Romans 5. Listen, the more the church was persecuted in its early days, the more it grew. The spread of the gospel in Acts was a result of persecution of believers. Jesus says to that church, be faithful unto death. It's an interesting encouragement, isn't it? You're tested severely right now. It's going to get worse. Be faithful until you die. That kind of encouragement could only make sense if you had an eternal perspective. Light and momentary affliction produces for us an eternal weight of glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but what is unseen. And we would say with Jim Elliot, he is no fool who gives up what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. And Jesus promises the crown of life to such. To the church at Pergamum, verse 16, to those who had grown comfortable with compromise, Jesus says, repent. Or else I'm coming to you quickly and I will make war with the sword of my mouth. If you have grown comfortable with compromise in your life, you've you've entertained things, you've brought things into your life that are a stumbling block for you, you need a 180 degree turnaround, an about face. Take radical measures. Cut out those things that are a temptation towards sexual immorality. For the church at at Pergamum, it was pagan feasts and drunkenness. And the church corporately was to cease being comfortable with compromise. How does the church corporately do that? Galatians 6.1, you who are spiritual, when you see a brother caught in any trespass, restore such a one with gentleness, looking to yourself that you also not be tempted to follow through on the Matthew 18 process. This is how the church loves one another in the body of Christ and rejects comfort with compromise. How does the individual Christian do this? Take radical measures with sin in your life. Make no provision for the flesh. To Thyatira in chapter two, verse 25, if you're a, if you're a, 
a church that tolerates false teachers. Stop it. And to the believers at Thyatira, if you're in a church with false teachers and you can't go anywhere, Jesus gave this command, hold fast. He says to the rest, to the remainder, to those not holding on to the teaching, those who have not known the deep things of Satan as they call them, I place no other burden on you than to hold fast. Hold on to faith, persevere, resist. Listen, the, the, fle- the fledgling band of believers in that church faced a different kind of pressure. There's the pressure that comes from the outside world, from people who don't love Christ and they persecute. There's a different kind of pressure from churches or self-professing believers who are persecuting those who are remaining faithful. That would be a hard environment to live in. And there are many in our world today who live in cities and areas without good churches. And this command would resonate, hold tight, persevere, hold fast until I come. At Sardis, Jesus gave these commands to a church on life support. Wake up, strengthen what remains, and remember what you've received and heard. This was a church in hospice care with a flicker of life. There were some at Sardis who had not soiled their garments, Jesus said. What is the command? Wake up. If you find yourself here this morning and and you recognize there is no spiritual life in you, you are going through religious motions, you go to church because you think you ought to, Maybe you've made several attempts to clean up your own life to no avail and you have no power over sin and your conscience hasn't been cleansed and you don't have assurance of eternity. The commands here are wake up, come alive, experience new life that is only to be found in Jesus Christ. What was the problem with this dead church? The the church had departed from what they had received and heard. They probably had caved to societal pressures. You know, the, the message of the church of Jesus Christ is offensive. It's offensive to a culture in slavery to rebellion. And if the church doesn't want to be offensive anymore, what does it do? It, it softens the message. It alters the message. It changes the message so as to blend in. Maybe that describes your own life. Maybe there was a time where you thought Jesus was everything and it was worth suffering anything to have him, but, but your light has grown dim and the aroma of your Christian life has grown faint. Are there people in your life, if you... If they were asked, is there any reason to assume that so-and-so is a Christian? Could they give evidence to that in your life? Would the people around you say, that one has the aroma of life and death. (laughs) Smells like a Christian. Or are you indistinguishable from the world around you? You do what the world does, you talk like the world talks, you live like the world lives, You watch what the world watches. You laugh at what the world laughs at. Wake up. Strengthen what remains. And remember what you have heard. Jesus goes on and tells them to keep it. It's reminiscent of Jude 3. The faith once for all handed down to the saints. Remember that and keep that. Be comfortable with confronting the culture. Loyalty to Christ and loyalty to the truth will be offensive. Don't erase the offense of having the only answer to life's problems. And Jesus says to them, repent. This requires urgent action, an urgent return to the truth, an urgent return to necessarily offending the world and its culture with goodness and light and life and mercy and the free offer of salvation. It is offensive. To the Philadelphian church in chapter three, verse 11, the church that was little and powerful, here's the command, hold fast what you 
have. And let no one take your crown. That was the athletic crown of victory. All by itself, it was worthless. It was some leaves wrapped around a twig placed on the head if you won an athletic game. And yet what it represented was eternal life. And if someone were to steal an athletic wreath, it would be valueless to them, but costly to you. Listen, there are malevolent forces in the world, Satan at the helm of them, who would seek to destroy your spiritual life and rob you of eternity. Hold on to what you have. Don't let anybody take your crown. To Laodicea, the command is serious. You are nauseatingly self-satisfied, says Jesus. Buy from me gold refined by fire. Laodicea was a banking center filled with gold. And Jesus said, everything you have is worthless. This is why the gospel is offensive to self-satisfied religious people who pull themselves up by their own bootstraps, who think to themselves, I have what it takes to get to God. And Jesus says, you must recognize your abject poverty spiritually. You think you see, but you're blind. You think you're clothed in splendor and you're naked. You think you're wealthy, self-sufficient, and you are wretched and bankrupt. Jesus says, come to me to get what you need. Gold refined in heaven's fires, white garments representing the righteousness of Jesus Christ. I salve that you may see. Jesus says, be zealous and repent. Maybe you've been captive to man-made religions, thinking your whole life that you just gotta do stuff on the hamster wheel of human achievement to make yourself right before God. It's futile. It hasn't worked yet, and it won't work ever. But the free offer of the gospel is to surrender and come to grace, be forgiven, and have life. What follows, lastly in our outline, are the promises. All of these are promises to the overcomer. That is, the one who has enduring faith to the end, to the believer. In Ephesians 2, 7, what is promised the overcomer? The tree of life and the paradise of God. Security, safety, provision, paradise of eternal life in God's presence. To Smyrna in 2, 11, the promise not to be hurt by the second death. The second death is the lake of fire. To Pergamum in 2, 17, the hidden manna. Manna was that bread from heaven that came down in the wilderness that fed the the Israelites as they made their way out of Egyptian slavery into the promised land. Forty years, God fed them with white, sweet bread from heaven, sustaining them in a desert wasteland. In contrast to the feasting and revelry that the world may offer that rots in the gut and rots the soul, God offers an enduring feast and it is safekeeping for you that remain faithful to him. God says, I will give him a white stone and a new name. For the Christian, this is a symbol of a new identity, new life, new status, new family, new belonging, new eternal destination. And a new name is a new personal identifier from Christ, one that you will know in heaven. To Thyatira, the promise is, to the victor, authority over the nations. Authority over the nations. A hostile world that hates Christ and is in antipathy against his church will one day bow the knee to Christ and all who are faithful will reign with him. The church at Sardis, Jesus promises they will walk with me in white for they are worthy not worthy of their own merit, but as Paul says in Philippians 3, not having a righteousness of their own that comes from law-keeping, 
but the righteousness that is by faith in Jesus Christ, the righteousness of God that comes as a free gift in the gospel. And the promise there is, I will not erase his name from the book of life. In no way will you lose your citizenship in heaven if you remain loyal to Christ. You might get kicked out of clubs here. You might get kicked out of associations here. You might get canceled. But you will never be thrown out of the book of life. A promise from Jesus for loyalty to him. You might think, Christian, that there is safety in being non-offensive. But if it costs you the truth, it costs you everything. To the church at Philadelphia, the promise was several fold. Vindication for one. Some who were their enemies would believe the gospel and bow at the knee of Jesus. Wouldn't that be great? Christian, are you praying for your enemies? Those who wrong you, those who are hostile towards you? Pray for your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Wouldn't it be great if they bowed the knee to Christ and they were your brother or your sister? They were also promised exemption from the tribulation. They had already passed the test. They get to go home. They ace the class. They skip the final. That is not an escape from tribulation and trouble and hardship and trial in this world. All believers are destined for these things. But it was a promise of protection from the final worldwide tribulation that was coming on the whole earth. And then a security of salvation. Verse 12, overcomers are promised to be a pillar of in the city of God. That is an unshakable feature in an imperturbable structure that meant a lot in Philadelphia, rocked by earthquakes. They wouldn't have to go out anymore. They could be permanent and secure, never have to leave the safety of God's presence in his new city. They would have on themselves the name of God, the name of the city of God, and Christ's new name. And to Laodicea, Jesus promises the overcomer, I will grant him to sit down with me on my throne as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. That is shocking privilege. The right of authority over the universe, the right of rulership over the kingdom belongs to God. He is seen to put his son on that throne and the son wants co-heirs to reign with him in his kingdom. You think about your station in life, what it means to, to give up things to follow Christ. Do you understand the promise of Christ? There is nothing you could give up here that would not be worth completely and totally throwing away to get what Jesus has promised you in eternity. It's all worth it. We summarize these promises They are promises related to eternal life, paradise, security, escape from the lake of fire, a feast in God's presence, new identity, perfect righteousness, vindication, bypassing the great tribulation, security forever with God, reigning with Christ in his coming kingdom, and the greatest promise of all, unending access to the glorious presence of the triune God. Jesus said to the overcomer, I will give the morning star. Later in the book of Revelation, that is revealed to be Jesus himself. This God, the giver of all things, the source of all delights, seeks to give of himself to his loyal subjects forever and ever and ever in increasing delight. What will it mean to be in God's presence? It will mean very quickly to forget the hardships, the toil, the struggles, the very heavy burdens and sorrows that this life brings they will evaporate in a glorious weight of eternity. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for these letters. We pray that we would take to heart the questions these produce. May we seek your examination. May we be measured by your metrics. We pray that your penetrating gaze and that sharp two-edged sword, though painful in its scrutiny and surgery, would bring about the joy of life in you, fruitfulness in you. Would you cut out those things which are displeasing to you in our lives that we might be vessels 
fit for your service as ambassadors as long as you leave us on the earth. Come what may, may we bring you glory. Amen.